Good evening, Slovenia. What a great pleasure and honor it is to finish my personal journey of 2014 in this wonderful city and this amazing country of yours. I'm truly privileged that such a large number of people have come out to listen to a crazy South African and, uh, and a bunch of other crazy researchers like Sam Osmanagic and, and this crazy Austrian uh, Klaus Donner with these crazy inexplicable artifacts and a crazy Russian. It's like a joke, you know. What do you, you know, a, a, a Russian, an Austrian, a Bosnian and a South African walk into a pub. <laughs> and at the pub are sitting a bunch of scientists. And sorry, I'll stop there. <laughs> But uh, just before I start, I was given um, these two amazing t-shirts by one of our uh, members, the Ubuntu Slovenia members here. I have two t-shirts that I'm going to just put down here, and they are medium size, they're lady size, and uh, anybody that is, feels they need to have one of these, desperately need one of these, um, please feel free to come and grab them so that... Uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, don't have a fight over them now, right? <laughs> oh yeah, I've got this. Uh, I've got this thing here. So let's take this journey of discovery. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to connect the dots between the ancient past and where we are today, and see if we can learn something from the ancient civilization. See if we can learn some wisdom that will help us today because how many of you here today feel that the world as it is is just beautiful, just perfect, that everything is just hunky-dory and we are heading for a great success as the human race? Just raise your hand if you think everything is just perfect. Great. <laughs> so, you see... I don't have to say much more than that. Clearly, we all know that something is wrong with this crazy world of ours, that, that something doesn't quite sit right. And if we don't recognize it and truly embrace this recognition that something is wrong with our world, and if we don't embrace the fact that we have to do something about this, nothing is going to happen. And this is really the point of departure that I'd like to leave on this note. And what I found is that when I started looking at the ancient civilizations and the history of this planet, everything became very, very clear. And the message from the ancient civilizations became very, very clear as to what we should be doing today as the human race. And quite frankly, personally for me, it is the most exciting journey that I ever could have imagined that I embarked on some 10 years ago when I first started talking about this. So let's carry on. The fact that we don't have immediate answers to these three simple questions is a big problem. Who are we? Where do we come from? Why are we here? All of us have asked ourselves these questions at some stage, and yet we don't have these answers. Somehow, we just can't answer them with ease. And yet, when you look at ancient civilizations, they seem to have a lot more clear answers on these issues. And yet, that information has slowly but surely been eroded over thousands of years to today, where we keep scratching our heads, wondering what went wrong. Clearly, the fact that we can't answer these questions points to the fact that we are a species with amnesia because we've lost this information over a long period. And now comes a time when people like you gather in places like this, when we are regaining our knowledge, regaining our consciousness, regaining the lost information, and finding that we are uniting this species called the human race, rather than carry on the division and the separation that has kept us apart and at war and at odds with each other for so long. Those days are over because you now know as well as I know that we are the ones we've been waiting for. 
History is much older, much stranger, and much more exciting than you could have ever realized. That's certainly the realization that I had when I started looking at this. And the, the ancient texts tell us that when the gods were on earth, they were giants. Now, when you go down to the pub for a drink, and you start to talk to somebody at the bar, and you say, hey, how about these giants? They'll look at you like you're crazy. And yet, it is not anything new. All of human history, all of the history of this planet is filled with stories of giants. So there is really, there are very few greater stories or examples of how strange the history of this planet has been. And this is the example that I'm talking about. Real example of giants in human history. This footprint is about two hours drive from my house in South Africa and has become a great attraction for people all over the world because they're scratching their head wondering how is this possible. And yet here it is. A clear evidence has been analyzed in all kinds of ways. There is no doubt it is a real footprint. It is not erosion. This is real human history that we cannot quite understand today. The reason I'm so excited about this is because my friend Klaus Donner over here, as you can see, actually found the evidence of a giant in Ecuador and had the bones examined and they turned out to be the bones of a seven and a half meter giant that would have left a footprint about this size. And this is really exciting because now we're finding the evidence of giants not only in South Africa, but right across the Atlantic in Ecuador and all kinds of other places around the world. Giants tell us that the history of this planet is far more mysterious and far stranger than most of us could have imagined. As far as the, the, the age of this planet and the age of human history, there is no greater or better example than Stonehenge. When I first went there, I couldn't believe that one of the most obvious geological indicators of the age of Stonehenge has been completely overlooked and ignored by geologists for as long as they've been going there. If you can see this, um, this stone here. Okay, let's do it. That stone up over there fell over. It used to stand upright and be connected to that one. It fell over and broke. It broke over there. Well, it's a big problem, that, because if you look at it from the side, there's the break. There's about 50 centimeters of erosion on that break. 50 centimeters of erosion on one of the hardest stones known to mankind, sarsen stone. Not in a million years are you going to get 50 centimeters of erosion in a few thousand years. So there is the, the indicator of how old Stonehenge is, probably well more than a million years old. It's not possible for that stone to erode so quickly after it's broken. I'm, I'm not telling you why it's there or how in that state, but all I'm telling you is let's look at the obvious indicators, the scientific geological indicators, and they're telling us that Stonehenge is extremely, extremely old, indicating that the history of our planet is extremely old. And that takes us to the history of Southern Africa. And most of the history books that you'll open, you'll see images like this showing you how the people migrated from East Africa or West Africa through East Africa, and then they made their way down, eventually ending up in Southern Africa. And history books tell us that Southern Africa was a sparsely populated part of the world with hardly anybody living there until two or 3,000 years ago. Well, nothing can be further from the truth because the ancient ruins of Southern Africa tell us a completely different tale. They tell us that it was a densely populated part of the world, that there were large numbers of people living there doing weird and wonderful things that we are only now starting to recognize and understand the fact that these people were very, very advanced. They had a knowledge of the laws of nature and they used a technology that we only now coming to understand in the leading edge of science and the scientific world today. Just to show you what some of these stone ruins look like, 
We call them stone circles in South Africa. It's just an affectionate name that we've come up with, the stone circles of Southern Africa, because they are circular in nature. And uh, what you'll find is that everyone is circular, and yet everyone is completely unique. There are no two stone circles that are the same. Some of them have simple internal structures, some of them have complex internal structures, but the most important thing you need to look at are not just the stone circles, but all the stuff in between, like there. And th this, there's, a, there's a channel that runs there, there's another circle there, there's all kinds of stuff going on here, more stuff going on here. And as you start looking at these photographs from the air, most of the time when you walk on the ground, you don't even know you're walking through these stone circles. It's only when you start looking at them from aerial photographs, that you start to recognize what you're actually looking at. Some have complex internal structures, others very simple. The other important thing to see that no stone circle stands alone. They're all part of a large grid connected by this huge spider's web effect or actually terraces that connect them together. There you can see here's the circle and all the stuff around it that is completely eroded and covered by soil. When you're on the ground looking at this one here, you have no idea that there's all the stuff attached to it here. There's a horseshoe shape structure with a circle inside it and a stone right in the middle. And you start wondering, what on earth is going on here? Here you can see the beautiful example of a lot of activity on the outside of the stone circle. And here you can see, even from this aerial photograph, you can see all the stuff here buried beneath the soil and sand. And in there is a clue as to what happened to all these stone circles. The sand and soil that has covered most of them. We're only seeing probably less than, less than 10% of the original structures. And then some of them are beautiful flower-shaped structures. Beautiful flower-shaped structures that make no sense whatsoever. And a channel that runs out of it into another channel over there. And then a channel that used to connect it to the strange hexagonal cluster of cells here. And you start finding more and more of these strange clusters of hexagonal cells that make no sense whatsoever because you would not build such a structure as a dwelling or a place. Why? You'll find out soon. The other important thing is that uh, what you'll notice is that they all, and this is a brilliant work of Jan Heiner that he, that he discovered more than 15 or 20 years ago already at this stage, when he first started photographing these stone circles from the air, and he started to realize that, uh, that they aligned with the north, south, east, west, and, um, and that they aligned with solstices and equinoxes. And then I started looking at it and realized that it's not just aligned with the, with the, um, the movement of the sun, but also sacred geometry and five factor. And you start seeing hexagons emerging out of the structure and equilateral triangles and, and uh, realizing that when you get a star tetrahedron in a stone structure, it obviously tells you that we're dealing with much more than a cattle kraal built for cows uh, and far more interesting than just a place built by migrating tribes as dwellings. And the reason why we know that they're not dwellings is because they're connected by these strange channels. These channels that connect them, as you can see over there, that connect all these stone circles together. And they run for hundreds of kilometers, connecting all the circles and all the clusters of circles. There's another um, channel running there, as you can see, into another hexagonal cluster of hexagonal cells over there that um, are very strange indeed. And if we have time at the end, I'll explain to you what those are actually for. Example, more examples of beautiful channels running out of the circles. Remember that our, our current history books and archaeological books tell us that most of these are cattle crawl or cattle enclosures built for cows. 
and that is just of, of little historic value. Um, and it is spectacular, the ignorance and naivety of our academics, that they still have not recognized the importance of these structures. When you look at Great Zimbabwe from the air, you realize that it is part of the same system. It's very obvious we're dealing with the same structural, architectural structure, and uh, except Great Zimbabwe is much, much larger and far more impressive, and I'll show you more photographs of it later. Agricultural terraces that cover 450,000 square kilometers clearly tell us that this is not a sparsely populated part of the world. And when you start looking at mountains, you see the terraces, entire mountains covered in terraces. Um, Google Earth starts to show you that there are ancient terraces that are still clearly visible. This is just up the road from my house. The entire mountain and mountains around us look like this. It doesn't stop. It is quite spectacular. Here you've got channels, stone circles, another stone circle, stone circle, stone circle, all the terraces that hold it together. And then often these channels run down straight into the river. There's a river down at the bottom here. And for a long time I didn't understand why these channels would just run and end in a river for no reason whatsoever. Now it makes a lot more sense now that we've figured out what these things are all about. When you get to the top of the mountain, it looks something like this. And from this point, you're looking at about a 100 kilometer radius that it looks like this. Not anymore, but it would have looked like this a long time ago. Today, you find patches of it in distant parts. Sometimes it's destroyed by forestry. Sometimes it's destroyed by new towns and new buildings and roads. So, um, but large clusters of this still exist. The most important thing we found, no doors and entrances. Now, when you discover that there are no doors and entrances, you have to immediately eliminate the possibility that these were dwellings for people or dwellings for cows. And uh, that's where the argument of cattle kraal comes to a sudden and abrupt end. And we have to start looking at other possibilities, what these stone circles are all about. Here's an archaeological drawing from 1939, clearly showing us they have no doors and entrances and that they're all connected by these weird channels. And sometimes they're not just singular, sometimes they're concentric circles with no doors and entrances, all connected. And when I saw this drawing, an archaeological, official archaeological drawing showing us concentric circles, I got very excited because that's how my mind works. I start seeing immediate al alternative solutions for this. The question um, that I asked myself some time ago was, where is the flagship or the most important of the ruins in southern Africa? Remember that these ruins cover large parts of South Africa, large parts of Botswana, pretty much most of Zimbabwe. They cross over into Mozambique and they also go across the Zambezi River into Zambia. So we're looking at a very large area that was covered by stone circles like this. There is a, <clears throat> there's some gr strange phenomenon and I, know, I don't want to digress too much otherwise I'll be here for four hours. So um, the, there's a gr strange phenomenon for example in, uh, in Zimbabwe. There are ancient trees, baobab trees that are 3,000 years old or some, maybe even older that are growing out of the walls of these stone circles. So it clearly tells us that these walls of the stone circles are at least 3,000 years old when you've got giant ancient trees growing out of the walls. But when you ask our historians, they tell you that, no, you see, the, the people of the time had a strange custom. They used to build the walls into the tree. <laughs> so I asked myself, where is the flagship? And there's no doubt that the flagship is what I have called and what has become known as Adam's calendar. It has become very quickly, in a short space of five years, probably one of the most important ancient sites on planet Earth together with the discovery of the Bosnian Pyramid and a few other sites on Earth. But Adam's calendar was discovered by accident by this man here, Johann Heine, who flew over it and he realized that this is not just an accidental arrangement of rocks. When he came back, 
He measured it and he spent five years analyzing it before I met him. And then he shared his information with me and here we are today. Um, what he found is that this stone here, this stone here casts a shadow on the stone and the shadow tells you exactly which, part, which day of the year you are. It starts here on the summer solstice and moves across all across until the winter solstice and it ends over there and then it comes back. So you can tell every day of the year by where the shadow is and where you are in the year. It's aligned with north, south, east, west and solstices and equinoxes. And uh, when I met with Baba Kreda Mutwa, he told me that he was initiated at this sacred place in 1937 as a young shaman. Baba Kreda Mutwa is uh, one of the great African shaman and um, he is a, a knowledge keeper of ancient African knowledge and tradition. And he also told me that it is known as in Zulu tradition as Inzalo Yelanga, or birthplace of the sun, where humanity was created by the gods. And I asked him, which gods created humanity at this place? And he said, it was a special guy by the name of Enki. And we start realizing how closely connected ancient African knowledge is to the Sumerian texts to which we're going to get very soon. It is also known by, um, by Baba Credo as a, the place where heaven mated with Mother Earth. And this becomes an important story once again when you start looking at the, the cloning process or the, the breeding process of whatever you want to call it by these beings called the Anunnaki and what actually happened at this place which is held by the ancient African knowledge keepers. Just to explain to you quickly, this is what Adam's calendar looks like today. It's very badly destroyed. All those stones, they are dolerite. They don't belong there. They come from somewhere else. They are not part of this bedrock. This is the edge of the cliff. It drops about 200 meters down here, and then it drops another 600 meters into the valley down in here. So it drops almost a kilometer down into the Barberton Valley. But there is north. That tree is south. North-south runs right between the two central calendar stones. And as you can see, it was originally a circular structure. And on the edge here, we have the Horus Stone and the three stones that line up with the rise of Orion's belt uh, over here, down here. So right on the edge of a cliff, um, all those stones were brought from somewhere else to build the site. This is a close-up look of it. Um, north, south, north, south, east, west. There's your Horus stone and the three stones of Orion. You can clearly see this very pointy stone. That's the one that actually attracted our attention in the beginning. This is what it looks like in 3D um, reconstruction. North-south line here. West, looking east at the sunrise over there, and who who meets the sun? Horus meets the sunrise, looking at Orion over here, and you start seeing the repetition of many ancient sites. And over there in the distance, you can see very clearly there are two very distinct peaks that are known as Adam's Calendar's Pyramids and I'll talk about them a little bit later. Since we're here talking about pyramids, I haven't spoken about them before here in, in Europe. When you connect Adam's calendar through Great Zimbabwe or Enki's home, you get to the Great Pyramid of Giza, all running on this beautiful 31 degrees east longitudinal line, which is known as the Nilotic Meridian, 31 degrees east. Great Pyramid, Great Zimbabwe, Adam's Calendar. It's also interesting to note that the numeric value for the word Elohim is 31. Here we have one of the first photographs of Johann Heine measuring the site, and there you can see the pyramids very clearly visible. Early in the morning, you can see them the best when the sun is behind them. We don't know whether they're pyramids. They look like mountains covered with soil. They are full of rocks and trees, but they display very unique properties, very similar to the stone circles. 
the energies that we measured there clearly tell us that something strange is going on there. And when I drew a golden spiral to see if they connected, because ancient cultures did everything with sacred geometry, I realized that they have to be connected because when you draw a golden spiral from Adam's calendar, it ends up right between the pyramids. So the probability factor that it is an accident is several million to one. So they seem to be connected. When you go there, you lose GPS, um, you lose satellite signal, and uh, it, is, it displays very similar characteristics as we find in the stone circles. But one of the most important discoveries about Adam's calendar is the archaeoastronomy. And this has been, um, even recently, when we were in Bosnia, um, um, I had some uh, bra brand new information given to me by Paul LaViolette, an astrophysicist and, um, and a scientist of high regard, who suggested some interesting information to me. What you can see here, that it's originally a circular structure, but north-south do not lie at 12 o'clock. Look, there's north-south over there. This is not 12 o'clock. When we measured it, we realized that it was out by 3 degrees, 17 minutes, and 42 seconds. And that doesn't make any sense. North-south does not move. Something dramatic has to happen for the north-south axis of the Earth to move out by 3 degrees, or nearly 4 degrees. And uh, one of the things that could have happened is what Charles Habgood was calling a crustal displacement or a crustal shift. He suggests that every few hundred thousand years, the Earth undergoes some giant cataclysmic event that causes north-south to shift away from where it is. Well, that's what we have. Adam's calendar was built at a time when north-south was not where it is today. That's irrefutable. We just don't know when that happened. Well, Paul LaViolette suggested, this is Paul LaViolette on the left here, um, he suggested to me just last week that there was an event in his book, Earth Under Fire, he talks about this. There was an event about 40,000 years ago that was so severe that would have been able to actually shift north-south away from where it was to where it is today. So we're starting to gain more and more scientific evidence for this and why Adam's calendar is such an important site. But it's only when you realize how many ruins we are dealing with in South Africa that you start to realize how significant this discovery is. So in 1891, first of all, the, I must just tell you, in case you think this is a new discovery, actually, it's not a new discovery at all. The stone circles have been... Um, written about 500 years ago, the Portuguese settlers, when they first, the explorers rather, the Portuguese explorers, when they first came from Europe around down Africa and around the Cape of Good Hope and up towards India, when they came around southern, the southern tip of Africa and they came onto the shore from Mozambique, they met the local people and they asked, who built all these stone ruins? And they were told by the local people then, we don't know. We didn't build them. And yet, our historians today tell us, we know exactly who built them. We know when they built them and who built them because the people in the 1400s were stupid. They didn't know. We know who built them. And that's what they put in our history books. Unfortunately, that's not what the Portuguese explorers tell us. This is Great Zimbabwe, the inside of Great Zimbabwe, the famous conical tower. Conical tower, cone shape, very important in my research. So when I see cones, I get very excited. doesn't matter how big or how small they are. It's what they do. But in 1891, Theodore Bent, who was one of the first people to truly excavate Great Zimbabwe, um, estimated from horseback traveling from South Africa, Botswana, into Zimbabwe, he estimated there were about 4,000 of these ruins. Then by, by 1974, Roger Summers had more technology available, and I discovered at this stage in, in the early 2000s, I discovered that he estimated that there were about 20,000 of these ruins, and I got very excited. I thought, I live, in the, I live in the land of Indiana Jones, and I thought, this is going to be an interesting ride. Little did I know how interesting it was going to be. So, um, and then I got involved in 2007 after meeting Johann Heiner. 
and everything changed. Within six months, I walked through at least a thousand ruins myself. So I thought, if I can walk through a thousand ruins within six months, there must be at least a hundred thousand of these. So I started counting because I was writing a book on it. I didn't just want to put a number in there. So I started counting and I used Google Earth and aerial photographs and you can do this yourself so you know that I'm not lying. You can go and do this exercise. Anyone can do it. And I extrapolated. I got average per square kilometer and average per hectare and average per 100 square meters. And I came up with about 3.26 stone circles per hectare. This is something else, by the way. I don't think we've got time to even go into this, but this is a whole new area of my research uh, in the last uh, year or so. And this is, again, close to our house in Waterfallbofen. And by the time I finished counting, I counted more than 10 million of these stone ruins. And when you reach this number, I, I went back and I started counting again. I thought I was making a mistake. It's just not possible for there to be 10 million but I was right. And I realized at that moment that we're looking at a civilization we've never seen before. There is clear evidence of a vanished civilization that we've never heard of. We have no idea who they are or what they were doing, but here is the evidence. And this makes us realize that we know nothing about our history and we have to go back to connecting the dots of our origins, who we are, where we come from, and why we're here. And the stone circles of South Africa are a great place to start. This is my good friend Miho Ledwith. Some of you may remember him from a great documentary movie called What the Bleep Do We Know? And he featured quite heavily in that. And as you can see, he ha had some very interesting company for about 17 years of his life. He was the advisor to these two popes at the Vatican. And then he woke up and got the hell out of there. Well, what he discovered is very, very important, but mostly unknown or ignored by scholars of the Bible. He discovered that the opening phrase of the Bible that we all know that says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that that is not in fact accurate and true. And when I had breakfast with him just the other day, in Washington State, he wrote with his own hand on the napkin at the breakfast table. So I took a photograph of it for posterity so I can share it with people like you. And uh, the original Hebrew Bible actually says the following. This is the original phrase. Ba Rashid bara Elohim et ha shamaim wa et ha eares, which means this is what until now it stood for. Um, in the beginning, God, I'm oh, sorry, created, and then Elohim, which is the plural for God. El is the singular. Elohim is the plural. So already that opening statement doesn't make any sense. Um, and, or it means both and, both and heavens, both and earth. So that even as it is right now in Hebrew, that statement doesn't make any sense because there's a plural for God, a plural for God, the gods. When he added this letter here, the letter Aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and all sacred texts have to have the letter Aleph at the beginning of the sentence because it's a mathematical formula, the way they write it. When he, when he added the letter Aleph, it changed everything. And suddenly, the opening statement of the Bible makes a completely different statement and complete sense in its grammatical form. Suddenly it says, the father of the beginnings created the Elohim, the heavens and the earth. Let me go back here. Because that suddenly becomes Abba, which means father. Father of the beginnings created the Elohim and the heavens and the earth. Suddenly it is grammatically correct and makes sense. It is that one letter that was emitted that has fooled all of us for thousands of years. And this is very exciting. Why? Because it instantly brings into, into harmony 
the opening phrase of the Bible and most other ancient civilizations when they talk about the creator that created everything out of sound and resonance. And that's where it brings us to this point of departure. Very exciting in the field of science today, the leading edge of science on whatever level you may look, sound and resonance are the common links of religion and creation. In Christianity, we have the word, God said, let there be light. In Buddhism, we have the Om or the Aum. The Egyptians believed that the universe was sung into creation. This beautiful Hindu creation story is so dramatic that I'm going to have to read it out for you. I hope the translators can, can um, keep up with this one. Everything was so peaceful and silent that Vishnu slept undisturbed by dreams or motion. From the depths, a humming sound began to tremble. Um, it grew and spread, filling the emptiness and throbbing with energy. The night had ended. Vishnu awoke. It's just a far more dramatic way of saying, God said, let there be light. And I like this one. I like drama, but good drama, you know. Not so popular drama. And we realize how important these ancient stories are. The six days of creation are critical to our understanding and embracing the science called sacred geometry. Sacred geometry is that the foundation of all our knowledge, all our sciences, all our mathematics, all our physics, all our astronomy, all our geometry comes down to understanding sacred geometry. And you realize how deeply encoded it is in all these creation stories. The six aspects of Om. Not only does this talk about sacred geometry but also the resonance of the creation you can see in this beautiful image that shows us a cymatic pattern of a creative process the Maya creation story talks about the heart of sky and six other deities including the feathered serpent who wanted to create human beings with hearts and minds who could keep the days so that they could work like slaves <laughs> The six aspects of the all-seeing eye of Horus clearly indicate here that we're dealing with resonance ratios. It's very obvious, and so this hidden secret information gets exposed. What does this all mean? What does this have to do with ancient civilizations? Everything, because it tells us that they understood sound and frequency, they understood resonance, and they used sound as a source of energy, pretty much for everything they did. But sound and frequency was also used by the ancients to control humanity. Those elite who understood and had the tools to use sound and resonance and frequency as a tool to manipulate humanity. And they encode this in countless number of ancient artworks, in carvings in rock and stone and clay tablets in Sumerian seals. All this information is deeply encoded and we realize that the all-seeing eye of Horus actually depicts the pineal gland and tells us that we've been controlled through the manipulation of our pineal gland which is actually a frequency receiver and a transmitter that should allow us to communicate telepathically. So, if you're going to create a species with amnesia that you can lie to, that you can manipulate, that you can mistreat and abuse, one of the first things you're going to have to do is make sure they cannot communicate telepathically. Because if I can read your mind, there's no way that you can lie to me. You're not going to get away with that. So that will be the first place to start. Make sure that they can't communicate telepathically and then you can lie to them. And you can treat them like idiots. And they'll believe every lie you tell them. And guess what? That's where we still are today. But many of us are waking up and we're no longer believing the lies, right? Taking control humanity through cone-shaped tools. You'll see these countless drawings and carvings of these winged beings and bird beings using cone-shaped tools to do something to humanity or op 
performing some sort of operation. Here you can see around what has been described by many as a tree of life or, or some other aspect of, of human conditioning using cone-shaped tools. And notice this weird-looking wristwatch that this guy has got. Well, it's not a wristwatch. It's another very important device. They control the pineal gland and the DNA with sound and frequency. And this continues today. Today, we've been controlled through sound and frequency, through TV, radio, cell phones, Wi-Fi, all the frequencies in our lives that control us in ways that we cannot understand. The electrosmog and the amount of frequencies around us are so damaging to us, to most, to many of us, that some people actually lose their minds. Some people can't deal with all the stuff, the frequencies that are around us. They continue to do so. There's your, that wristwatch there. There's half of it over there. Twelve cones. Twelve cones pointing to the middle. They, all this stuff is deeply encoded. Okay, there you can see your all-seeing eye of Horus. In CBS News, there's your, there's your all-seeing eye. And then here, there's your cone and your... Um, this symbol here, cone-shaped tools. So that brings us to, well, what is sound? What is this thing called sound? And I'll describe it as the breath of the Creator. All the ancient cultures tell us that the, that the creation came out of a resonance. So let's call that resonance that the breath or the sound of the Creator. Let's call that the prime resonance frequency out of which everything came. Let's call that the breath of the Creator. And everything creation, for that reason, everything in creation resonates in harmony because everything comes out of that one source of resonance. Harmonic coherence, not dissonance. If you're in dissonance with your environment, if you're in dissonance with the planet Earth, with the people around you, you're in dis-ease. And that's where the word comes from, disease. You get sick if you're not in harmony with everything around you. You get sick and you are in disease. The universe is just an extension of our bodies that should resonate with everything else. And this is where we should start looking at how we should behave as individuals within our own community and within our own town, within our own family, and then eventually on the whole planet, resonating and then being in harmony with everything around us. Remember that the cells in your body Every cell in your body, the trillions of cells in your body, every one of those cells has got its own prime resonance frequency at which it vibrates. The, the liver cells do not attack your stomach cells. The stomach cells don't attack your heart cells. Your heart cells don't attack your brain. Your brain doesn't attack your skin. They're all working together for the greater benefit of your whole body. And in there lies a very important lesson for us to learn about working together in coherent harmony and not working in competition against each other on any level of our existence. doesn't matter what level you look at. To understand ancient technology, because this is all about ancient technology as well, we have to understand the source code. And I think we've just seen the source code, the prime resonant frequency of everything in creation. So let's look at sound and resonance and what amazing things that sound and resonance does. Sound levitates. It boils water. It creates light. It creates DNA. Sound heals and destroys pathogens. Sound moves beyond the speed of light. It's one of the best kept secrets in science. You should have seen this on CNN, but no, it's far too dangerous. We can't show people that sound can move beyond the speed of light. They might get too many ideas. Sound energizes water and the air we breathe. And sound is the precursor to electromagneticism and the electromagnetic universe we find ourselves in. Cymatics is the name for sound coming to life and manifesting physical shapes and physical forms. It's a beautiful example of starting to understand how sound can make manifest physical form out of nothing. Every sound frequency has its own very specific shape. This is the fundamental entry level understanding of how sound manifests physical form in an infinite number of shapes. The higher the frequency, 
frequency, the more complex the structure. It's amazing. You, know, you can never get enough of watching this stuff. It's like <laughs> watching life happen. <laughs> um, and remember that we create sound with our mouths and our throats as we speak. We're creating infinite number of shapes and sounds that will allow us or should allow us to manifest like wizards and magicians used to be able to manifest by speaking words and using their wands made of Hollywood, <laughs> creating wonderful images, creating physical form. And you start to understand what Hollywood is actually all about. Because that was the wood from a holly tree was used for the ones of wizards. So let's look at the human voice and see how many amazing shapes, infinite number of shapes we can create with our human voice. This is known as the cymoscope. It's a spectacular device that actually shows you in real time what your voice looks like. I imagine this in 3D. Stop it there, because she repeats the same notes over and over again. But uh, just go go onto YouTube and put in cymatics and cymoscope, and you'll get that and probably new videos on YouTube that you can watch. This is uh, the work of Robert Brunman from Holland. It's just the spectacular example of sound tra trapped by light in a droplet of water. Once again, showing you these are the Mayan numbers that he used, 20 hertz and 13 hertz showing us the spectacular physical manifestation of sound. This is a light beam going through an electron, a photograph of a light beam going through an electron, clearly showing us that the electron is made up of coherent resonance. That's pretty much what it is, that the stuff, the, everything around us is made up of resonance. Even at this level, we can see that it's all about the sound, frequency, and resonance. The original people of Australia sometimes referred to as the ab-original, which is like saying abnormal. So let's not call them abnormal, let's call them the original people of Australia. Uh, talk about the time began when supernatural beings awoke and broke through the surface of the earth. They moved about the earth, bringing into being the physical features of the landscapes. And they did this with three sacred songs. So imagine the surface of the earth. Imagine the earth resonating, which it does. 
and shaking everything into beautiful form, creating mountains, creating valleys and rivers. And that's exactly what you'll find when you see Hans Jenny's beautiful work. And I recommend, if you haven't seen Hans Jenny's documentary, go online, you can watch the whole thing. This is just a short little clip to show you how the surface of the earth would have been created from the vibrations and the sound of the earth. This is not a liquid or a jelly or an oil that you see. This is powder, very, very fine powder on a metal plate that's vibrating. Circular shapes appear, but these are in a state of continuous upheaval. The particles are pushed outwards from the center and inwards again from the outside. And at the same time, they pulsate. Imagine this over millions of years happening on the surface of the earth. As the Aboriginal story says, bringing the shape of the earth into formation. can recognize the various patterns of the vibratory fields. They move to and fro, unite, and separate again according to the vibratory state of the surface formed by the membrane. And we can, as it were, move over a landscape which is in a state of vibration. If we intensify the note, if we produce a crescendo for the ear, the masses are hurled outwards. We see fountains, eruptions, explosions almost, but invariably the particles return to the center, so that here again, even under these violently dynamic conditions, we find there is circulation. Okay, I'm going to stop it here because it just carries on for a bit. Um, another very important discovery in sound happened in 2005 that at the Middle Tennessee State University they made sound move beyond the speed of light. It was published in 2007 in the American Institute of Physics, but boy, you're not going to see this on CNN because again, that's not good for people to start putting these ideas together. Sound beyond the speed of light. And then two years later, the scientific journal started talking about laser technology, using sound as a laser beam. And if you use a laser beam, you're going to need something to focus the sound into a beam. In a laser, you use crystals that focus the light into a co coherent beam, if it works, sometimes when it works. <laughs> there you go. So here you go. And, and laser beams can be can be benign, they can do nothing, or laser beams can cut metal in a split second. Very powerful tools. Now in a laser, you don't need a clear crystal because you don't, we're not working with light. With laser beam, all you need is something that'll spiral the sound through a vortex and shoot it out through a tip. So something that'll focus the sound into a beam. Sound is the inspiration for religious symbols. When you take one of the cymoscope bubbles and you cut it in half, you can see that cross over there in the middle. Very clear example. If you look deeper into it, you'll find a very clear indicator where the religious movements, especially Christianity, got their symbol from because it comes from the sound of the Creator you realize that they knew exactly what they were doing when they were creating their symbols. All this part of the occult secret societies and the early priest kings, they were given knowledge and power and tools and weapons of mass destruction to control humanity with. Even the medicine wheel in Native American culture is a cross in a circle, suggesting to us that sound heals, and that the medicine men understood that sound is a healer. And um, let's look at sound and frequency as tools and technology. 
there's not a greater example in in human history and the sacred text and the Ark of the Covenant as an advanced ancient technology. It defeated large armies, the Ark on its own. It brought down the walls of Jericho. How did it bring down the walls of Jericho? Um, he was um, Joshua, Joshua, I forgot his name for a second. Jo- there is Joshua, yes, sorry. Joshua was told to march around the city for six days carrying the ark and have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them s- sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout and the walls of the city will come tumbling down. They're telling us they brought the walls of Jericho down with sound and resonance and probably an electromagnetic pulse of some sort that came from the Ark of the Covenant. Royal Raymond Drive in 1931 was the man that found the cure for all disease. And how did he do this? By identifying the prime resonance frequency of the cells in your body, specifically the cancer cells, that he could then manipulate with sound and resonance so that the cancer cells will either become whole or heal themselves or simply get destroyed. He cured cancer and all kinds of other disease. I had the privilege of seeing his handwritten document, a book about this fat of Royal Raymond Drive's personal handwriting. I saw this book in a private library connection uh, collection in Sedona, Arizona, just about a month ago. And in there, um, I could have put the photographs in here. I, I wasn't thinking clearly. Um, in there, you see the frequencies for tuberculosis, syphilis, gonorrhea, uh, Ebola. He's even got the, the, the frequency for Ebola in there. It's, it's incredible. This fat book for all the how to cure all diseases. Neurons transmit information via sound. It's not possible, actually, for neurons to transmit um, signals through electromagnetic or electric pulses. Otherwise, they'd heat up and your body will overheat. So something is wrong with that information. Neurons use sound to transmit information. And apparently, they do it with seven primary frequencies. Peter Davy in New Zealand was boiling water with sound until he died a few years ago, and he took that secret to his grave. That little device in his hand, you put it in the water, and it starts to boil the water instantly. It doesn't heat it up. It boils the water because of the prime resonance frequency that activates the, the, molecular, the molecular structure of the water. It doesn't heat it up. It vibrates it. So... I found a guy in in, um, in Sydney, Australia, actually, that has re-engineered this, and he's been boiling water with it. So we haven't lost this technology, and I'm very excited about this because this is one of the technologies we can use for humanity. Because instead of b- burning coal or using nuclear reaction to boil water, so we can create steam, so we can create electricity, we can use these little devices here to boil the water, to create the steam, to create the electricity. And we don't have to pollute our world. So it's one very small step up to freeing ourselves and giving humanity free electricity. So I'll be working on this when I get home very, very soon. Sound limitates. This is a great example of how sound limitates. And until you see this, often you can't imagine how sound can limitate. I spoke to David Deeks for about two hours on Skype. He lives on Long Island, New York. And he told me that it's so sensitive. He could manipulate those things with such precision. Just the slightest frequency adjustment would make it spin or bop up and down or tumble or do anything you wanted to do by just manipulating the frequencies. You can hear now a subtle change in frequency and it starts to spin. It's so subtle you can hardly hear it. So 
just by looking at this, you can imagine how you can, for example, drill a hole with absolute precision, with sound. Okay, let your mind run, wi run wild, let your mind run away with itself. <laughs> imagine the impossible. Okay, John Keely in 1888 was doing similar kind of stuff with sound, levitating metal balls, drilling precise holes into rock, and crushing giant blocks with sound in a very, very short space of time. Something it takes hours for us to do today with big metal balls in the mining industry, crushing the rock so we can process it. And the most incredible thing that sound accomplished in the last several years was Luc Montagnier in 2011, regenerated DNA with sound frequency, spontaneous generation of DNA. Now, when you hear this, you've got to immediately imagine what we are, what our bodies are. We have DNA in every nucleus of every cell in your skin. So if you can spontaneously generate DNA with sound and resonance, that means that our entire body is just a manifestation of sound and resonance. And things start to become a lot clearer as to why sound and resonance can heal and cure all disease. Even on a genetic level, we should be able to cure all disease. Magnetrons are used as resonance cavity generators for very, very high energy. Resonant cavity magnetrons these are used in microwaves, in laser beams. Magnetrons are used in very high-end technology. And it's to do with resonance. You can see that. Resonant cavity magnetron generating very, very high energy. Sound creates light. This experiment has been done many times by people. Uh, sometimes they, they, play, they do these things with Christmas lights on their Christmas trees. And then I found Daniel and Eric and Nunes in New York City. And he's been making these vortex coils. And he told me that by putting sound frequency into the middle of the coil, he actually managed to turn gas into plasma. That's how much energy the sound generated in that little vortex coil. And that got me thinking. I realized that sound is the ultimate source of free energy. That's what we're looking at. It's all around us. It's everywhere. The earth rings like a bell. It never stops ringing. The earth is a giant resonator. And this man here, that you should all know very well, knew this. And he used the earth as a resonator. And that's what he did when he built his Tesla tower. What's interesting about the Tesla tower, by the way, it's also conical. It's got a very distinct conical shape. And at the top of the tower, that, that ball, that uh, circular thing on top, the tower actually reaches its apex at the top. And I suspect that's got a lot to do with the structure and, and what Tesla actually did that, using the sound of the earth for unlimited energy. And then I discovered recently from a crazy German scientist called Christian Langer, that sound energizes the air we breathe. And it's actually the sound th that we create when we breathe in to our lungs that is the carrier of the energy. Because remember, we breathe oxygen in and we breathe the oxygen out. And then at medical school, we get taught that it's the, oh, we use the oxygen. And then the oxygen goes into our blood. And the oxygen gets used in the, the red blood cells and the hemoglobin and all this. And, and then and I say, well... If we're using the oxygen, then why do we breathe the oxygen out? What happens there? And you realize that it's actually the sound that we make in our lungs that is the energizing aspect of the oxygen. And then the oxygen gets stripped of its energy and we breathe the oxygen out again. And this is important because this is where we start getting into hypersound. Hypersound that is very new science that very few people are aware of. Sound moving beyond the speed of light. And that's what I believe happens in our lungs. By the time the sound reaches your alveoli, it is moving at hypersound velocities, creating huge amounts of energy and storing it in the oxygen. And when you look at the alveoli and uh, they very clear hexagonal structures, these channels, the bronchi, 
that run into hexagonal structures, and I think you're getting an idea what I'm talking about. Some of the circular stone structures look just like this. Channels that run into hexagonal cluster of cells that make no sense other than they were used for geoengineering or the generation of an atmosphere or creation of oxygen or the energizing of the oxygen or something like that. And this is getting more and more exciting as we research the stone circles. On the 5th of August, this paper was published that sound acts as a cloak of invisibility. You can now, we can now use sound to hide things and they make, sound makes things disappear. And then they talk about this plastic pyramid that they made with these weird levels. Look at these levels, these pyramids, plastic pyramid like this. Does this remind you of some other pyramids and some other structures? And, and when they expose this to certain sound frequencies, everything below it disappears, becomes invisible, including the pyramid itself. And this is spectacular because you start to realize why the monks and the Buddhists and the Eastern philosophy people built their structures that look like this. Because when you sit inside these structures and you, and you chant and you create sounds, it's quite possible that you actually make the entire building because of that structure disappear, go out of this reality into some other reality. I was talking to some people in Washington State that told me they were, they were in a bath, in a, in a steam bath, a group, a group of them, and they were chanting and sounding, and it was resonating quite loudly with their eyes closed, and he said he opened his eyes at one stage and he was freaked out because the walls of the building were gone. You know, now when somebody tells you this, you go, oh really, you know, <laughs> come on. But, you know, why would somebody be telling you this? So you're resonating, he opened his eyes and the walls were gone and he was so freaked out, the moment he thought about it, whoosh, the walls came back and they were back in, in this reality. It is just, again, um, the interference of your thought frequencies that destroy that, that frequency. So taking control of humanity with cone-shaped tools becomes a very important thing, and this is what I've called the ice cream cone phenomenon, because you find ice cream cone activity everywhere. Ed Leeds Colnan that built Coral Castle, this amazing place at the southern tip of Florida, apparently did it with ice cream cones, just like those ancient drawings of the guys holding the cones. That's what Ed Leeds Colnan was seen to be doing holding ice cream cones in his hands and moving these giant blocks around all on his own. And I've been picking up these cone-shaped tools around the stone ruins of southern Africa, and you start finding them everywhere, in an ancient mine in England, and in Egypt you get cone-shaped tools that nobody has understood until now. The Native American medicine men use cone-shaped tools in their ceremonies, and the conical tower in Great Zimbabwe is just a giant cone facing the sky. And even in Australia, they have cone-shaped tools. Look how happy I am. I was given this cone-shaped tools just there recently when we were on tour there. And then these ones are really the, the game breaker here. They're the ones that give it away. These cone-shaped tools are in the Rosicrucian Museum in San Jose, California. They were retrieved from stone temples in Sumeria and they're covered in Sumerian writing, as you can see, cuneiform. And the writing tells us that these cone-shaped tools commemorate the building of the temples in Sumer, specifically a temple of Inanna. And so it goes. And then we realize that we've got rods and cones in our retina. And we start to realize that maybe the light and sound that enters our eyes could be used in ways that we haven't really utilized, like this guy here. And becoming supernatural by activating our pineal gland and connecting, reconnecting it properly to our optic nerve should give us some interesting superhuman abilities that we've lost when we became a species with amnesia. What's all this activity in Southern Africa about? It's always about the gold. You know this, right? You cannot separate humanity and our history from gold. It's not possible. And remember, 
that the gold always belonged to the gods, no matter where the, the thugs from Europe, you remember that's about 500 years ago, a bunch of guys got on boats and they went around the world and then they invaded the whole bloody world and put their flag in the ground and said, this land now belongs to us. So I called them the thugs from Europe, specifically from certain nations and uh, that have colonized the world and still control it as such. Whenever they arrived and they met these native people and they found they had loads of gold, when they asked them, who does the gold belong to? They were told, the gold belongs to the gods. And these guys from Europe thought, God, these guys are stupid. We'll just take their gold. <laughs> and they did. They took their gold. <laughs> and the 11th century, we learned from Ahbet al-Biruni that describes the prosperous gold exports from the port of Safala. Where is the port of Safala? Where Mozambique is. And you can see the great kingdom of Monomotapa, the golden kings of Africa, vast kingdom that ruled for hundreds of years. The gold was a month's journey inland from the port of Safala. This port no longer exists. It's now underwater. But if you go a month inland, that's where Safala was, modern, modern day Baira in Mozambique. If you go a month inland, you get to this place here called Masvingo in Zimbabwe. And what is at Masvingo? Great Zimbabwe. One of the greatest ruins in the world today. Quite spectacular. 10 meter high walls, 6 meters wide. Where I can tell you when you go up to the wall and you tap on it like this, the whole wall resonates like one giant resonator. It is quite spectacular. In Leidenberg, a little town about 45 minutes from my house that is famous for these Leidenberg heads, 75,000 gold mines were counted in between 2005 and 2010. Ancient tunnels were found in the cities by gold miners, tunnels that shouldn't be there that confuse these poor gold miners. You know, you're digging for gold and suddenly you find an old ancient tunnel. So what's going on here? Who's somebody's been here before me? And I must tell you that there are vast, vast tunnel networks in South Africa, ancient mining tunnels that we know about that have been reported and that we've detected, especially with Klaus Donner's uh, special technology that can detect these tunnels. And then in between 1975 and 1971 and 1975, uh, a team of um, mine rescue team that were doing some testing their equipment in a town called Cartonville found a paved tunnel that was paved all the way around, something like this. And in that tunnel, they found a statue of pre-Inca god Viracocha. Now remember that the Incas were known for their gold huge amounts of gold. So once again, we got a connection to ancient gold mining that connects South Africa to the Incas right across the Atlantic and the Americas. It's all about the gold in the past and in modern times. More recent times, the South African war between 1899 and 1902, known as the Anglo-Boer War, or the South African War was all about the gold. And this man on the right, Cecil John Rhodes, probably the most evil man that has lived uh, in the last um, century or so who orchestrated all this stuff but we must love him, we must embrace him and love the man because he taught us what we shouldn't be doing going to war against each other um, Anglo-Boer War was and remains the most expensive war Britain, the British Empire has ever fought the most expensive war until today, including all the wars they've ever fought. Why? Because it was all about the gold. They had to secure the gold supplies in South Africa and Southern Africa, which included Zimbabwe. Why? Because of this man here, Paul Kruger, who made a discovery that rocked and shook the empire. Paul Kruger is known for two things, the Kruger Park and gold. He had a lot of gold. On the 4th of June, 1900, 1900, a train filled with gold, several coaches full of gold, left Pretoria 
for the port of Mozambique, in the town of Waterfallbrofen, my town where I live today, the train mysteriously disappeared, never to be seen again. And that gold remains one of the biggest treasure hunting obsessions with treasure hunters around the world. The question we should ask ourselves is where did Paul Kruger get all the gold? Because in the year 1900, there wasn't enough gold in the whole bloody world to fill a few train coaches with gold. And in there lies the reason why the royal bloodlines from the British Empire sent 470,000 soldiers to South Africa to make sure that secret didn't get out. Because I believe Paul Kruger found the Anunnaki gold and made him the most dangerous man in the world that the royal bloodlines in England had to take care of and had to control. And this is the answers we find in ancient texts, the ancient Sumerian texts, where we read about the Anunnaki or the Anuna gods, the gods of heaven and earth that came to earth to find gold and they created a species called the Lulu Amelu to help them mine the gold. And we learn about Anu and Enlil and Enki, the father and the two sons who divided the planet into the northern and the southern hemispheres and took control of those. We learn about the work in the Abzu by Enki, where the gold came from. And we start getting some very inter interesting translations like this one here. In the Abzu, Enki plans was conceiving where to build his house, where for heroes dwellings to prepare, where the bowels of the earth to enter, to mine the gold. And this is all about Enki's house, his mines his tech and his technology. And by the way, Great Zimbabwe is what I call Enki's house, or the big white house on the hill, the mine manager's house. It might not have been where he actually lived, but it's certainly the headquarters or the most energetic place in the vast ancient gold mining empire of the Anunnaki. This is a great translation because this suggests that they used sound and sazer beam technology to make their mine shafts. The earth splitter Enki there established Therewith in the earth a gash to make, by way of tunnels, earth's innards to reach, the golden veins to uncover. And then we, and then we read about the, the whole creation process of the primitive worker to help the Anunnaki mine the gold, and the symbol that is often associated with Enki, the creator god of the human race. Remember that ancient African wisdom and knowledge keepers tell us that Enki was the creator of the people, of the human race. And that creation happened at Adam's calendar, or in Zalo Yalanga, the birthplace of the sun. And this is what we read here. Let us create a Lulu, a primitive worker, the hardship work to take over. Let the being, the toil of the Anunnaki carry on his back. And it continues. A primitive worker shall be created. Our command will he understand. Our tools he will handle. To the Anunnaki in the Abzu, relief shall come. What is interesting about this little image is, this is supposedly an image of the creation of Adamu. And look, he's holding a cone-shaped tool in his hand there. I've been looking at this for years, and only recently I realized that, oh my goodness, it looks like a cone-shaped tool. And so it is. So what kind of stone are the ones made of? made of stones that ring like bells. When I realized that the stones associated with the stone ruins in South Africa ring like bells, everything changed. And uh, here is just a little example of how the stones ring like bells from my little museum. Let me also just show you how some of these other stones ring like bells. Uh, this is what I call, and when, as you can see, we find many, many of these elongated stones. This one is full of patina. It's thick patina, so it's quite dull, but you can still hear the effect. And this is a, a beautiful one. This one actually rings at two different frequencies. Dun, dun, dun. 
Dun, dun, dun. They, they quite large. Look at this. Look at this one. And it looks also like it was inserted into something up to that point. And also, remember, they all ring like bells. This, this one is no exception. See, it's the same note. This thing really rings like a bell and it reverberates for quite a long time. Same note. It's an E flat. For those of you that have perfect there you pitch. Go. Demonstration. <laughs> okay, so stones that ring like bells, very important. What are the stones made of? Metamorphosized quartzite. Quartzite conducts sound, it conducts light. Quartzite silica has memory. It is the stuff of advanced technology. All the most advanced technology we have in the world today, from fiber optics to computer, Silicon Valley, silicon chips, is all based on quartz. Silicon-based technology. And the fact that we can now store trillions of terabytes in crystals clearly shows us we're moving into another level of understanding how to interact with our natural environment. We don't have to extract the quartz anymore. And remember, the fact that we can store digital data in crystals is very dangerous. And very soon, the Americans are probably going to pass a new law that says crystals are dangerous to your health. Crystals cause cancer. We're going to have to take the crystals away from you. And they're going to send men with guns to your home to take crystals away from you. Or something as stupid like that. And uh, it also makes it then very obvious that the stone structures, ancient stones, are all memory banks. Stone Age computers, like a giant Silicon Valley. And very soon, some 12-year-old kid with an iPhone is going to walk up to Stonehenge and plug it in and download some really interesting stuff that hopefully we can understand and I hope he puts it on YouTube. <laughs> so share it. But it also makes obvious now what the crystal skulls are all about. They huge giant information storage devices that carry trillions of terabytes of information, almost infinite. And that these ancient sites like the pyramids are giant machines, like Nikola Tesla's resonating device and free energy devices using the resonance of the earth, activated by light and sound. This is why they are aligned with the movement of the sun and the solstices and equinoxes. When the light comes up there, it's the, it's the, the stimulation that actually, it's like pressing enter on your computer and it activates the machine to do something. And when the sun sets over there, it activates the machine to do something else. And that's exactly what the stone circles in South Africa are all about. They are machines. They are energy generating devices. You can see very obviously that they look like cymatic patterns. And that's exactly what they are. They are energy, powerful energy generating devices. Every stone circle represents a sound frequency as it comes out of Mother Earth at that specific point, turning it into a very powerful energy generating device. Why do I know this? Because we've measured it. I'm not saying it because I got a warm, fuzzy feeling in my stomach about it. We know it for sure, scientifically tested and proven, and no one can argue against it. And this is the spectacular point of really getting to grips with ancient technology and the fact that they understood sound and resonance way beyond our wildest imagination. Some of these structures are built in the shape of magnetrons. Magnetrons that can cut metal in a split second. A tiny magnetron. Imagine how much energy a magnetron 20 meters in diameter can create. I was told by several psychics that that magnetron as it is there will create more energy than all the power plants on Earth today. The problem is we have thousands of those kind of structures in South Africa. So you can imagine how much energy they were generating. Caesar-based technology. When we read about the Earth splitter, 
Enki there established within with which in the earth a gash to make. I think they're talking about something like this, this kind of technology. We're looking at a giant energy grid that covers large parts of Southern Africa and it's still active. We've measured it, we've measured the electromagnetic activities, the sound frequencies and the loudness. In fact, I just last week I was speaking to a, a scientific colleague of Christian Lange, the guy that found the, the, the activation of, of the sound um, through breathing. Um, and his scientist friend, who's asked to remain anonymous at this stage, um, told me that he's measured hypersound coming out of these stone ruins. This is brand new information. I've never shared this before with anyone. Hypersound coming out in excess of 7,000 decibels, people. Okay, now, that's not a number you throw around easily in public, <laughs> right? We're dealing with extremely powerful energy here. Over 7,000 decibels coming out of these stone circles. The sound frequencies we measured coming out of these walls are 33 and a half gigahertz. You don't measure sound in nature in the gigahertz. It's not possible. The electromagnetic fields that run horizontally and shut off satellite so you don't get GPS as you walk in to the stone circles run at over 580 megahertz. These are powerful energy generating devices. And when you get to Adam's calendar, which now we believe is built by Enki himself, we measure stuff that doesn't make any sense. As you approach the circle from there, there's the circle. We normally park the cars over here and then walk. As you walk into the circle, it goes from nothing to over 375 gigahertz of sound. The mysterious thing is that there are no walls. There are no stone walls to generate the sound on the inside. And yet, that's what we measure, more than 375 gigahertz. Also, what we measure is a horizontal field of an electromagnetic field that runs horizontally, that shuts off GPS signals, so you don't get GPS on the inside. And then between the stones, the two central stones, that electromagnetic field runs even stronger, but it runs spirals vertically out of the ground into the sky. So we've got interlocking electromagnetic fields that run at 90 degree angles to each other. So what have we got there? we got one of these. And it's alive and it's well. Even in the badly broken down state of Adam's calendar, it is still giving us those incredibly high energies. So you can imagine how powerful it should have been or must have been when it was fully erect and constructed. What is it for? Possibly to beam up the gold. Who knows? You know, let your mind run free. <laughs> Let's have some fun with this, you know? <laughs> and that brings me to the sacred stones. Now, we've been measuring very powerful energies around these known as sacred stones, these stones with holes. They look like stone donuts. There are dozens of thousands of these in South Africa and Southern Africa. Dozens of thousands, but they're not easy to get a hold of. Says the technology was only shared with humanity in 2009. So I must tell you that when you talk about says the technology, some people are still not aware of it. And yet I believe that this is exactly what's happening here. If Daniel Nunes in New York City can create, can turn gas into plasma by using his little copper vortex coils, I realize that our silicon-based donut-shaped stones of very powerful toroid vortex generators creating huge amounts of energy. In fact, I can tell you, when we put them into a, when we put the stone into a, a bucket of water, the next morning thousands of tiny little bubbles had formed and were spiraling around going into the hole, into the middle of the stone, clearly showing us that there's a very active energy field going on there. But um, once again, this German scientist that emailed me just last week told me that he measured um, the stone at 2,200 decibels that it generates. And 
with the, that cone shaped tool there, it goes up to 3,450 decibels. So very, once again, creating hypersound out of nothing. Just as they lie, this is how much energy they are generating. We're dealing with advanced technology. How do we know this? Well, we know this from one example, and thanks to Homeland Security, this is how we know this. Because as you can see, last year in June, I took this stone to Nassim Haramein, who's a scientist on, on Hawaii, on the island of Kauai, who's got the Resonant Project Research Institute, and he's one of the great thinkers and the great minds in the world today. And I thought, if anyone can do some experiments with a stone, it'll be Nassim. So I packed this in my bag, and we were stopped at Doha Airport, and my girlfriend Louise was uh, pulled off the plane. We were sitting in the airplane, and I heard on the intercom, Louise Clark, please identify yourself. And uh, I looked at Louise and I said, what have you done? And the air hostess came running along and she said, you must follow me off the plane, ma'am. And I said, I'm not letting you off the plane on your own. So I followed her and, and there was my bag lying next to the airplane on the, on the tarmac with five guys with guns around my bag. So eventually lots of confusion. I go down and Louise stands up in the doorway of the plane the pilot is coming out, he's not happy, and in the meantime, I'm trying to open my bag, very nervous, thinking, what am I going to tell these guys with guns? It's not a good idea to tell them that this is ancient, advanced technology. <laughs> so, I can't tell them that. I think I'm going to have to tell them that it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a gift. It's a stone gift for my friend in Hawaii. And that's, that's uh, eventually, you know, have you ever tried to unwrap something wrapped tightly in bubble wrap and then wrapped tightly with plastic packing tape with five guys with guns? It's not easy. I was sweating profusely. <laughs> Eventually, when the stone popped out, they were very confused. Very confused. It's actually very strange what happened there because they didn't ask me to look through the rest of my bag. They checked nothing. They just took for granted that that was the thing. And there was one tall African guy there. He didn't have a gun. And he looked at the stone and he went, oh, I know those. And he turned around and walked away. And I, and I think he actually diffused the tension there. Because then they put, told me, okay, put it away. And then took the bag and I went up the stairs. And as I was going, I was thinking, the stone works. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time I sat down next to Louise, she said, you know, when the captain came out of the cockpit, he said that whatever is in that bag crashed the TSA security system. So, now that we know from my German scientist friend that the stone generates more than 2,500 decibels in sound, hypersound, we also have... Homeland Security and the TSA at the Doha International Airport in Qatar to thank for providing the evidence that this is indeed ancient advanced technology. <laughs> so if anybody asks you, is there any proof of ancient advanced technology, he says, you can tell them, yes, Michael Tellinger has it. <laughs> and that brings us to this grid around planet Earth. These ancient cultures didn't just put their sacred sites anywhere. They built them on special energetic nodal points. The Russians know this well. You can speak to Valery about this. He's got all the secrets of that, but he's probably not going to tell you. <laughs> so we'll find this amazing translation that I found in a Sumerian tablet that blew my mind. It says, in distant days... In those days after destinies had been decreed, after An, that's Anu, and Enlil had set up the regulations for heaven and earth. They set up regulations. These are serious dudes, okay? And like who, whoever these guys are, they set up regulations for heaven and earth. Enki, the exalted knowing God, by the rules for heaven and earth, the fixed rules, he set up cities. I think what they're telling us here is that they built their cities according to some predetermined energy grid that is in the sky and that's mirrored 
on the surface of the earth, or vice versa. And there they built the ancient cities. And this is where you find David Wilcox several years ago started sharing these emblems of the American military and Space Command and the Air Force were these bands around planet Earth. And those rings, those white rings, are referred to as the rules. Some sort of an energy grid around planet Earth. They don't know where it comes from, but it's always been there. And this is why they put it on their logos. You can go into David's website and research this in more detail. And this is where I realized that this thing is far more severe or serious than first meets the eye. Because we start looking at this ancient technology in Egypt. And these are not just temples, people. We're dealing with advanced technology. When, my, when I put my ear next to the tip of this, of this obelisk, guess what I found? It rings like a bell. And I knew we're dealing with the same kind of technology as the stone circles in southern Africa. There are too many pillars, not enough space. These places are not temples for worshipping or offering food here or delivering water there or praying to some god over here and kissing butt over there. It's not about that. It's not, it's, the design is all wrong. Too many pillars, not enough space. The geometry is all wrong. When you look at the Parthenon in Greece, if you look at around the structure of the, the famous... If you look around this famous structure, there's the remains of a geometric um, thing that was connected to it. The, the foundations are still there. And that was connected to this, too many pillars, and those pillars are connected to this, this is like a plug point, entrance point connected to this amphitheater. That amphitheater is connected to that amphitheater. And you realize that these are not temples. These are not places for worship and offering food. And they tell us that that's where the people lived. They're just making this stuff up as they go along. This one here is just spectacular. Look, concentric circles. There's a platform with all these pillars that make no sense and another open area like the Parthenon. And you start to realize that, hold on, these are not temples, they are templates. Templates for what? For giant circuit boards, giant energy circuits. That's what these things are. It's got nothing to do with worshiping and offering food. It's advanced technology silicon-based technology on a gigantic scale. Since I've started sharing this at some of my presentations, I've had circuit designers and circuit board scientists come to me afterwards and explain to me exactly how it works. And they totally, they explain to me how that is absolutely correct and why it works and how it works. This is just blows my mind. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. You're like, what? <laughs> And that's not the dwelling quarters, that's the circuit board, you know. But you can imagine, this is, see, I think here's a great example of how it's so dangerous to compartmentalize information and why we should not study history and archaeology and geography and mathematics and physics and astronomy. You can't study just one thing because then you become stupid because you have no idea What's going on over here? You've got to be able to look at all these things together and be able to join the dots. Otherwise, you'll just not get it and people start laughing at you. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you know, that's what Samus Managit says. 10 years from now, 50 years from now, people are going to be laughing at the historians and the academics that are laughing at us today. They're going to be laughing at them just like Today we laugh at the people that said, oh, the world is flat. We laugh at them. But boy, if you said the world is not flat, you got burned at the stake. So, you see, this is how this information goes on this giant merry-go-round. And when you combine water and quartz and silica, oh my God, you've got some very powerful technology that we only starting to understand. This one blows my mind. It's like, no way, man. No way. <laughs> Advanced technology. The rules of heaven and earth 
the energy grid around the earth that has been there forever, but they don't know who put it there. Well, the Sumerian texts tell us that it was Anu and Lil and Enki that did this kind of work. I got a call from my friend Paul Grevenstein, who's a South African farmer, who discovered the technology and started building 20 years ago these machines that can measure all kinds of energy fields from stars across our planet. And he phoned me out of the blue and said, I don't know how to tell you this, but I've detected like a binary code grid around the planet. Just when I was busy studying the stuff and researching it. And I said to him, Paul, you can't believe this, but that's exactly what I'm working on right now. And he said, but the, the code is broken. It's not, it's not uh, you know, whole anymore. It's in big patches, this binary code, just like the movie Matrix. It's exactly what we're dealing with here. People are the source of the energy that kept this Matrix around the planet Earth. And movies like the Matrix tell us this. They give us this information. Humans, human sound was the source for the energy that upholds the matrix. This is why they put these amphitheaters close to these circuit boards. They fill them with people, you scare them to death, uh, or you get them to make a lot of noise, and that noise is sound. We now know that sound is a very powerful source of energy, and they shoot that sound into the, that's the plug point, it starts the circuit board up and phew, bingo. Here's another one. There's your amphitheater and this beautiful line of resonating pillars that resonate the sound and into this, into this badly destroyed circuit board that it's hardly recognizable. Here's another one. There's your destroyed circuit board on top of the mountain and there's your amphitheater started up with the sound of people and activate the circuit board and you keep the energy grid in the sky. The question is, it's all very good that we know this information, but what are we going to do with this information? 